Everybody. I'm so happy to be here with such an awesome panel to talk about how we're using data uh, to guide us through this pandemic. Um, I, I want to start, Francis, with you, if we can, uh, because you are the source of a lot of this data. Take us back to a time when most of us didn't even know about this horrible coronavirus. Take us back to January when this virus was getting sequenced. Tell us about the role that you know, Illumina and genome sequencing has really played in helping us understand this horrible thing that's disrupted our entire lives. Sure, Meg. It's, it's interesting because when we look back, I think we're going to view this period as a time where genomics really entered the mainstream in terms of the battle against infectious disease. Because you know, before this, there was a little bit of use of genomics in, in, in dealing with infectious disease, but, but not a whole lot. Now, if we go back, you know, it actually started in sort of the November, December timeframe when our teams in China and Wuhan specifically were called in you know, to help analyze a, a, a pneumonia of unknown origin in, in Wuhan. And so we worked with the local CDC teams in China uh, to sequence the, the virus to try and identify, you know, what kind of virus it was. And it was at the end of December, beginning of January, that we, uh, working with the, the CDC teams in China, first came up with the sequence of the virus. And, and that was published on January 11th. Uh, you know, and, and that's when the first... Uh, genome of this of this unknown virus was published. We realized it was an, a novel pathogen. What's interesting is that day actually sparked off work on the other side of the world, where the CEO of Moderna and his team actually noticed the publication of the virus. And at the time, Stefan told his team, "Look, this is important. You know, we should start working on it." And, and he was working with the NIAID here in the U.S. And at the time, he said, "Look, we think you know if this is important, we need to." to be able to go into a human trial uh, or, or be ready to go into a human trial in 60 days. Now, a sentence like that is remarkable because if we look back on the history, you know, we haven't really had a vaccine for coronavirus ever. And it's, you know, a decade after, uh, after SARS and, and, you know, almost a decade after MERS. Uh, but, but that was what kicked off uh, Moderna, but a number of other companies actually starting to work on a vaccine. And, and when you think about the fact that at a company like Moderna, they've never had the virus on site at all. They have just been working off the genomic data that got published that January 11th. And so that's what kicked us off. Mm, I, re I mean, I think now that we think about that day, it seems like this real pivotal moment, January 11th, when the sequence was posted and all of these teams got their work underway. And so Rude, you know, coming over to you, kind of thinking about passing the baton from getting the information to then what what happens with that information? Tell us about how AstraZeneca got involved in this fight with COVID, um, you know, working with Oxford, but you've also got your own, you know, drug programs going on too. So, so kind of catch us up. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, uh, Max. So our involvement started also relatively early in the year with the, the collaboration uh, we have with the Oxford University. Uh, they are one of the, the premier institutes in the world regarding vaccine development. And they approached us whether there was a willingness on our side in order to help them with respect to the development and potentially the distribution of, 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 of their vaccine. So it has been uh, extremely uh, intense in the, in the last, uh, not, not only in the last few months, but uh, till, till now. It's a, it's a massive program regarding the phase uh, three trials. We have trials ongoing in the, in the UK, in Brazil, South Africa, Japan and also a trial ongoing in, in the United States. And I'm sure we will talk about that in, the, in, in a moment. But equally, it's, it's, it's very inspiring for us as a company because it's at the forefront of our mission in order to, 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 to help patients around the world. And of course, the, the, the crisis we are all facing is, is unprecedented. So that's one big pillar of, of our activities. The other activity is what you are already mentioning is, is our activities with respect to antibodies, neutralizing antibodies. Uh, we in license. Uh, 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 a cocktail of neutralizing antibodies from the Vanderbilt University and our engineers, antibody engineers, were able to, to, uh, to, to, to modify the antibodies in such a way that we have high hopes 
that our antibodies will be protective between six and 12 months. And that's a very important uh, uh, piece, especially for those patients who are immunocompromised or where the vaccine potentially is not going to work. And then the third pillar is that we are repurposing some of our medicines for patients who are severely ill. There's one cancer medicine, Calquence, and we are hoping in, in order to dampen the so-called cytokine storm in those patients so that patients uh, uh, can, can, can go off the intensive care unit sooner than, uh, than later. So it's a very comprehensive uh, plan in order to fight against this uh, terrible crisis. Mm. Well, I've got a lot of questions, as you alluded to, but I'm going to pass the baton around to Amy. You know, at FDA, people tend to think about the FDA as the gatekeeper, you know, kind of coming in once people have applied for approval. But tell us about what FDA has been doing this whole time. So, you know, as I, I think about uh, the timeline that you've been describing as it relates to data, I, I'm going to follow on and sort of think about the end of February, beginning of March, where all of a sudden we are realizing that we really don't understand the disease. We don't understand its natural history. We don't understand um, implications about what's going to happen to patients. It's really hard to even understand how to provide adequate advice on the design of clinical trials or to think about um, the backgrounds of issues such as um, events that are, we're expecting in the population. So in March, we started to ask the question, how do we start amassing the kinds of clinical data sets that are needed in order to inform this living textbook of the story of COVID-19. And as FDA, we prioritized a list of research questions that included what's the natural history of disease? What are the patterns of treatments patients are receiving? What are we seeing with respect to diagnostic tests used and the performance of diagnostic tests in the real world? How do we think about drugs that are potentially being repurposed for COVID-19 with respect to safety and anything that we can understand about effectiveness? And how can learnings from those activities also inform new work using real world and clinical trial data sets going forward. And so that actually was in March and really led to a book of work at the agency focused on how do we make sure that we're using data available from all sources, electronic health records, claims, um, as well as more formalized sources, such as clinical trials and formal clinical research to create really the total picture of what do we know about COVID-19 and really start um, to get ready for both how do we do the science, how do we actually learn from those data sets in a consistent, transparent, incredible way, and also how do we amass the information so that anybody can find it and put it to use for the design of trials, for the answering of natural history, et cetera. Yeah, there is just so much work along those lines going on. Making sure that people can actually use it is one of the big challenges. Um, you know, Francis, going back to that time, February, March, as we didn't realize that the virus was circulating here. It was work through sequencing that actually illuminated that. Uh, <laughs> uh, can you tell us just about how, how that worked? Yeah, what's really interesting is, you know, this experience has, has revealed, if you like, that we don't actually have a good system to do surveillance for, for pathogen outbreaks, right? It, it really isn't a really isn't anywhere near as robust as it could be or should be or comprehensive. And to your point, you know, we, we had, you know, the virus circulating in the U.S. for weeks at least before we even knew. And it, it really pointed out the fact that in, in the U.S., if, if we did have another outbreak, we don't have a systematic way of knowing. And it's not just a novel pathogen like coronavirus. It could be emerging antimicrobial resistance. It could be, you know, bioterrorism or biowarfare if we were hit. We wouldn't know for days or weeks or sometimes even months if we were even under attack. And so, you know, what happened in February was fortunately uh, there was a research team out in Seattle at the Fred Hutch. Uh, you know, it was Jason Drury's team, it was Trevor Bedford that were working on the Seattle flu project. So a project funded by Bill Gates to actually understand the outbreaks of, of flu happening in Seattle. And what Trevor realizes, well, he's been collecting all these samples now for a while and he had the sequence that was published. So he started looking backwards to say, well, have we had a, a coronavirus outbreak here in Seattle? And he started publishing some of the first results to show, yes, we have. And, and then he started, you know, sort of uh, publishing it. And so 
you know, one of the things that I think we'll take away from this pandemic, and we're starting to stand it up now to help with the pandemic, is that we do need a global surveillance system to manage these path to the pathogen outbreaks, a genomic-based system to understand, one, is there an outbreak even happening? And, and we need to catch it ideally in hours and days, not in weeks and months. Second, we need to understand, well, how is the you know, how is this spreading? Because it has policy implications. Trevor was able to show, for example, if you have outbreaks in your community that are coming from the outside, that can drive policy decisions that government officials can make around, for example, travel bans to say, look, we're not, but if you're starting to see community, you know, uh, transmission, then different policies come into place. So one, is an outbreak happening? Two, how is it transmitting? Third, how is it mutating, right? Is the virus changing fast enough that it's going to escape existing diagnostics, existing vaccines? Vaccines, existing therapies, or is it mutating more slowly, like fortunately this coronavirus is? And so it really highlighted we need a surveillance, a genomics-based surveillance system to do all of those things, to know if you have an outbreak, to know how it's being spread, and then also to know how it's evolving so you can understand the implications for vaccines and therapeutics and diagnostics. Mm, I really want to come back to you about this idea of the surveillance system that you're standing up, because that sounds really interesting. And I want to also you spend time, of course, looking forward about what tools we're gonna have coming out of this. Um, but Rude, I'm wondering if you can tell me, you know, there's all this data coming in. Um, how do you guys look at, as you're developing a vaccine, you know, that idea of, of mutations in the virus and, and what implications that might have? Yeah, no, absolutely. So, for, so first of all, of course, we have our internal experts, but the, the, the magnitude of this uh, crisis is so uh, enormous that we're working with a lot of other experts from academia, uh, and other research uh, centers. Um, and, and one of the, of course, unknowns at the moment is whether the, the, the coronavirus is going to mutate. And I think Richard was already alluding to that. We know, for example, in, for flu, that every year the vaccines have a different composition. And it's too early. Uh, and so far, there's not too much evidence that the coronavirus is, is really mutating, uh, mutating. But we need to be prepared in, in case that's, uh, that, that's going to happen. Um, so sequencing, and that's the area of expertise, of course, of, uh, of Francis, is, is in incredibly important. Uh, um, but as, as, as a company, yeah, we're working with, with experts all over the world in order to make sure that, uh, uh, that we have the, the right level of information in order to move relatively quickly with the, the, the technology we have in-house to, to at least to test the vaccines uh, sooner, than, uh, sooner than later. Mm. Well, let's talk about your vaccine, because, of course, you did run into a safety issue that paused the, the trial. Um, it remains paused in the United States. It has started around the world. What can you tell us about the current situation um, and what, you know, what de was detected about the issue and how you are assured uh, that it's safe to continue? Yeah, let me first try to explain very quickly what, what the normal procedure is, a, a clinical halt or uh, stopping a, a clinical trial is, is is well known in our industry and certainly also in vaccines. Um, and, and there's an independent data safety monitoring who is, who is really, really carefully assessing all potential side effects. And, and, and the, the data safety monitoring board at that, uh, at that moment uh, decided to advise us in order to, to do a so-called clinical halt. Uh, and I think uh, it, it, it is a testimony for the rigor of, of our processes, but also the, the, the rigor in order to make absolutely sure that we would like to have a safe and effective uh, vaccine. Uh, the good news is that many regulators have, have assessed the case, an independent uh, monitoring board have made, a, uh, made up their minds, and as a result of that, they decided that it was safe to, to continue. Also in the United States, uh, the, the FDA has asked us uh, quite a bit of information, and, and, and they have the right to do that, and we're very happy with that. And we are working with it in a very constructive way uh, with the FDA as we speak in order to answer all their, their questions. They're asking for information even many years uh, before. And we are, tr we are trying to provide all the information so that they can make their independent assessment whether they think it's, it's, it's safe to, uh, to continue. Now, once again, the good news is that the trial is already up and running again in the UK, in Brazil, South Africa and Japan for, for a few weeks. So we have good hopes but also the FDA will come to the same conclusion. Well, I'll bring Amy in in just one second, but I, um, you know, I'm curious to know, your, your vaccine regimen is two shots um, spaced a few weeks apart. What impact does it have on the trial that some people probably had their first shot and haven't been able to get their second one yet in the U.S.? 
Yeah, so that's uh, that's uh, that's uh, that's an excellent uh, question. And in fairness, um, we we are expecting le a little impact. Uh, what we know from our phase one, phase two data is that, in principle, one dose uh, is already inducing quite a lot of neutralizing antibodies. On top of that, we also know from our phase one, phase two uh, study that the vaccine is 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 is, uh, is inducing a very nice T cell response. Now, having said that. The, the 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 healthcare challenge is so uh, so huge that so far all companies have decided to move to a two dose regimen. But the fact that we are now in a clinical halt in the United States will have uh, relatively little uh, effect on uh, on our overall uh, trial outcome. Hmm. Will you be able to submit data with the one dose? You know, does that actually add to your data package? Yeah. No, that's another a great question. So we are in active uh, discussion as we speak with regulators uh, across the world. Uh, every regulator has a slightly different way of assessing the situation. The European regulators decided to start with a rolling review. Uh, you, have, you may have seen that. that. That means that we're already submitting data, what we have currently in our hands, so that they are not losing any time in order to do a proper assessment. Uh, once again, we are in active discussion with the FDA. It, it, it's going in a very collaborative uh, way, but it is in the, end, in the end of the day an assessment of of individual regulators, what they what they think is 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 is, is good and 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 for in order to to make the final assessment whether the vaccine is safe and effective. So let's wait and 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 over time we will see how regulators are assessing the different vaccines. Well, Amy, of course that brings me naturally over to you, and I know that you can't tell us exactly what is happening at the FDA on this or what the FDA will decide and when, but tell us about what this says about the process there. Um, you know, so first of all, as we pointed out, it's important to have an independent process with regulatory review by career experts at the FDA who have, you know, deep expertise in vaccines and regulatory review of vaccines, and where we have the opportunity to stop and, and do a thoughtful review of the data. And so that's part of that um, collaborative activity that Ruby was talking about. Um, it also surfaces... Um, the importance that as we think about the development and potential emergency authorization or full approval of, of vaccines in the future, we have the opportunity to think about what might be the continued evaluation of vaccines um, going forward. And, and just like we think about any other product potentially having um, a post-marketing evaluation. And, and in fact, um, two days ago in the meeting documents um, for our October 22nd advisory committee meeting um, for vaccines, um, there was a signal in those documents um, that the advisory committee will be speaking to how to think about post-marketing safety studies when there is a biological licensing application put forward um, for a COVID-19 vaccine. And also within the context of, for example, emergency use authorization to think about what kind of ongoing assessments are gonna be needed of the benefits and the risks of a, a COVID-19 19 vaccine. So I think that what we're going to see is really robust discussion of what should that look like, including populations beyond those who were initially studied. What do we need to think about with continued evaluation for late effects? How do we understand, for example, this issue of one versus um, uh, two shots? Um, that also highlights that um, we've got continued work to do to make sure that we understand who got what vaccine, for example, and we understand um, what data sets are needed and what mathematical solutions are going to be needed um, to do this work, perhaps on top of the usual vaccine adverse reporting activities that we usually think of. And, and so I expect that we will see a really robust discussion over the next um, weeks to months um, as this space starts to get filled in. Well, there seems to me that's interesting you, you brought that up. I mean, even just the challenges of following people while they get vaccinated, most of these, as you say, needs, need two shots. I guess Johnson & Johnson is in phase three with just one shot. But, um, you know, that's going to be really hard. And I've heard them talk about, uh, folks from Operation Warp Speed, the need for, you know, if you get your first shot at your doctor's office and then your second shot, you have to get at a CVS because you're on vacation or if anybody goes on vacation anymore, we're talking about interoperability of, of you know, healthcare systems 
they need to talk to each other. This has been like a decades long problem in healthcare. I mean, this is a question for the group. I don't even know who wants to weigh in on this, but like, how can we do this? And we're only talking about a few months from now. So I'll start and I would love to hear more from Francis and Ruth as well. Um, in fact, uh, a lot of the activities that we've had going on at FDA related to answering that first list of questions that I mentioned a, a few minutes, minutes ago really had two tasks. One was trying to answer questions such as around natural history, and two is really pressure testing what data sets are out there. How can we connect them um, in, in better ways? How, how do we know how to rely on issues such as connecting electronic health record data and claims data to try and address some of these things? So I think that there's been a lot of pressure testing going on. We certainly have the consistent systems that we've had in the past for vaccine reporting, such as VAERS. We've had systems that we've used for um, previous evaluation of vaccines and pandemics. But really, one of the questions that we've, really, we've been actively asking is how can the most contemporary systems work for us in a landscape where we want to basically use 2020 capabilities, but make sure that they, that they truly work? Yeah, I mean, Rude, I don't know, you have a unique perspective on this. Like, we look at the UK and the fact that they ran that beautiful recovery trial, got that answer on dexamethasone, it saves lives. And a lot of people point out, well, you can do that there because you have one healthcare system where everybody's data is included. And we don't have that here in the US. I mean, how do you look at the United States and the challenges our system poses? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a massive challenge on one hand, but equally uh, as a European, uh, I'm, I'm quite impressed about how, how it is organized. And in all our, in all our discussion with the Warp Speed uh, leadership, it's, it's, it's clear that they are setting up probably vaccination centers across the country. You also need to realize uh, you're talking about tens or hundreds of millions of people we need to vaccinate. And to make it very concrete, in, in, in our files, there will be 10 doses. So the nurse can vaccinate 10 people. So logistically, uh, you need to find a mechanism in order to do it in an efficient, uh, efficient way. And of course, the second dose is not very helpful, but knowing the devastating effect of coronavirus, we have the hope that, 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 uh, that participants uh, moving forward of people who want to get vaccinated are disciplined in order to ask for their shot after one month probably, uh, and, and, and that they will move to those vaccination uh, trials. But we're also from a safety perspective, we're setting up a huge databases. AstraZeneca is, is building up a capacity of 3.1 billion doses worldwide, not only for the United States, but also for the, uh, the underdeveloped and developing countries. So the effort is, 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 is massive. And, and let's not for, forget, you're vaccinating potentially healthy, healthy people. So you, you need to do that in a very rigorous way. So all the support we are going to get from, from, from other people who have more experience in this field is, is extremely useful. Yeah, one mm -hmm. of the other things, I, if I could add, and you know, you know, one of the other problems we're going to have to solve is that for most of next year, there's going to be a shortage. There's going to be more people who need it than there are going to be you know, doses available. And so one of the areas where there's a lot of genomic research happening is to try and understand you know, the susceptibility to the more severe outcomes. So who is most at risk? And so initially we were using heuristics like age, for example, though we know it's not perfect. You know, there are lots of cases now, if you know, the 90 plus year olds who've done really well and the 20 year olds who haven't. And so there's a huge amount of genomic research going on to say, can we stratify patients in some meaningful way to try and identify who should be pulled to the front of the line because they are more vulnerable? And, and what's interesting is, is to watch in countries like the UK, the NHS is doing a pretty big, you know, 35,000 person study. And, and to your point, Meg, you know, they may, may, they may have an easier time in terms of then, you know, sort of meeting out the doses appropriately, because again, it's a single payer system. But there's a, a huge amount of research happening about understanding how the virus actually operates, and then who is most susceptible. Yeah, I think it's so fascinating. And I know that people are using Illumina machines to do it. Some of the work coming out of Iceland with Kari Stephenson at Decode, and I've seen their giant rooms full of sequencers. Um, speaking of giant rooms full of sequencers, actually, Francis, I am interested to know, you know, what role can your sequencers play in being diagnostic tools? I mean, are they just too sophisticated of instruments to help with our testing problem? I've talked with the folks at the Broad Institute, you know, speaking of rooms full of sequencers, um, and they're using, you know, PCR machines to do all of their, you know, huge amounts of testing. So what, 
role does your technology play in diagnostics, if, if any, really here? That's another great question. And I've talked about the fact that, you know, genomics has been pulled into surveillance, into research. Um, and frankly, if I talked to you seven months ago and we talked about diagnosis and the use of sequencing, I'd have said, look, it's probably, it's inevitable, but it's five to 10 years away before genomics really sort of plays a big role in diagnostics. And that's because PCR has been there for decades. And, and so it's sort of a well-entrenched, you know, system. Um, but that's starting to change. We are being pulled. We have customers of ours that are now standing up sequencers to diagnostic testing. We've got from the FDA uh, an emergency use authorization for our COVID-seq product, and we have labs that have stood it up now to offer diagnostics. And then we have other customers that are standing up sequencing-based screening programs for healthy people. And the reason we're being pulled in is a couple of reasons. One, you just get more information if you use uh, sequencing. You get information on the viral genome, the full viral genome, whereas in PCR, you're only looking at sort of points, right? That is better in a number of ways. One, if the virus mutates, and it's mutating slowly, but there are two mutations a month on average now that have been happening since it's been discovered. And so if the virus ever mutates such that it escapes the PCR test, you know, some labs, for example, are using sequencing as a reflex test to test a certain percentage of positives and negatives to make sure that isn't happening or they have a false positive problem. So one, you just get more information. And in some single pair systems, that information is then used to drive policy decisions. So they're saying if we use sequencing for diagnostic testing and we see, for example, how the virus is traveling in our group, that helps us make travel decisions, for example, and, and so on around policies. So that some people want more information. Another thing that's emerged and we didn't expect was that, you know, uh, sequencing based diagnostic testing relies on an orthogonal supply chain to PCR based tests. And so there was so much demand that went after the PCR, you know, market that we started to get backlogs and then testing time started, you know, results came seven days, 10 days, in some cases, 21 days later, which is basically useless. Mm -hmm. And so now you're seeing a lot of labs saying, look, we need, you know, an orthogonal modality so that if we run into supply constraints on the P PCR side, we still have a sequencing based testing. And we're now at the stage where the, the pricing is not that different. The cost to the labs are not that different. And so they're starting to say, look, this gives us an alternative modality and it gives us the ability to make sure that the PCR tests are still effective and it gives us more information, which in some cases are useful. Screening is different. Screening is saying, let's go after healthy populations as part of a back to school initiative. So for example, we're working with the historically black colleges here in the US and they are running sequencing based screening tests on their populations on a regular basis, times a week to make sure that they don't have an outbreak happening and that people feel confident about safely getting back to school. And so sequencing is being used there as well because it, it can deliver pretty high throughput infrastructure um, especially when you do things like pooling, where you can then do very large populations quickly. Very interesting. I didn't realize you were doing all of that stuff. Um, Amy, I want to ask you a question. It's going to seem like it's coming out of nowhere, but you know, thinking about the FDA, you are in some ways you know, an agency that's held up as moving faster than has ever moved before in history. At the same time, you're a punching bag because you know, you're holding things up and it's not going fast enough. Um, you know, you're always kind of in this position, the FDA, but obviously a bigger spotlight being put on you now. So I'm just wondering, you know, what are things like there? Um, house morale, you know, should, and, you know, are, does this affect any of the work that you guys are going to be doing? Wow. Um, so, you know, first of all, to make sure that I've said this, as Principal Deputy Commissioner, I am the highest career um, official at the agency. So um, that that's important because, you know, in my role, I don't have a political responsibility or task. You know, as I think about um, working within the agency right now, um, there's a lot of noise going on around us, honestly, Meg. Um, and that's, that is the reality of today's scenario, but um, it still doesn't um, remove the fact that it's really important for us to keep doing our job. So, you know, what I've been thinking a lot about lately is what does leadership look like in the context of trying to make sure that the agency is moving forward and and, and what you just said. And so the first thing is that um, when there is a lot of noise going on around the agency to remind ourselves and just acknowledge that it's going on, but then to say, you know, the mission that we focus on an agency, as the agency protect and promote public health and to do so as an international gold standard does not change. 
And really that's what motivates people and gets them up every morning and has all the career professionals continue to do their job. Really, we continue then to actually do what we know how to do best, maintain a focus on the data and science, put, maintain a focus on the process, and, and make sure that we are looking hard and in a very deliberate and intentional way at, at all the questions that are coming from, in front of us. That being said, there's something else that you brought up, which is that we're being asked to do this faster than ever before in, with, in the response of a pandemic. And so it's been really important to acknowledge that the urgency is real and matters a lot, but that it's, this is a marathon, not a sprint. So we have to make sure that we develop ways that are working that are durable and are going to continue to get us through this. And so we talk about that in real ways and we make sure that the people who work at the agency understand mission, understand durability, and understand the, the importance of, of being able to keep doing our work in a very consistent fashion, no matter what. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people feel free <laughs> seeing you in the spotlight. Uh, Rude, I know I want to ask you about the role of industry here too. We've seen industry, you know, put out statements we don't normally see, the commitment to putting safety first. Um, you know, we've seen Albert Borla, the CEO of Pfizer, tweeting that they have not talked with the White House about the FDA's guidelines on vaccines. You know, AstraZeneca, I believe, has committed to uh, pursuing the vaccine on a not-for-profit basis during the pandemic. And you're talking about ramping up to billions of doses. You do have support from governments, uh, billions of dollars of support, but you know, tell me about the business decisions that you make here. And ultimately, do you make money on this after the pandemic? Yeah, so that's a, a, an absolute good and fair question, uh, uh, Max. So uh, let me first start again with the beginning that, that, that as an organization, we felt there was a need in order to step in in order to, in order to offer our support. Um, and the support is, 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 is very substantial. So it's true that some governments are financing uh, some of our clinical trials. But overall, the effort is, is, is massive. Building a supply chain in different geographies across the world is, a, is an enormous effort. It's complex. Um, you, you are dependent on, on many other uh, parties in order to make that happen. But equally, it's also incredibly inspiring in order to help to finish this terrible uh, health crisis in, in the world. And it fits very well with our mission as a company in order to do uh, what is good for, for patients. Equally, we have been very transparent in order to say, uh, listen, uh, during the pandemic, we were offered the vaccine uh, at no profit. And, and if there is a need over time to vaccinate on an annual basis, like the flu vaccine, then we will uh, commercialize the vaccine at a reasonable price. For us, it's far too early you know, to speculate when the pandemic will be over, what the price will be. Uh, we, we have been very clear externally that for, during the pandemic, it will be delivered at no profit. And the number one priority is, of course, to finish our clinical trial and fingers crossed that, that, that at least the vaccine is safe and effective. And, and, the, and, and in parallel with that, of course, it's extremely important that we are beefing up our manufacturing so that vaccine is available uh, when the FDA and other regulators are deciding that the vaccine is safe and effective. So those are the two main priorities in the next uh, few months. And what is happening afterwards, we will see and, and we will be as transparent as possible in order to inform uh, societies and, 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 and people. Well, we're just about out of time. And so I'm just going to ask uh, one quick question of Francis, because I mentioned the surveillance thing and I didn't get to come back to it. So uh, I'm going to ask you to quickly tell us how we're going to catch the next pandemic before it, uh, <laughs> before it happens. Will yeah, we? Well, you know, uh, it's, uh, I know everybody's focused on this pandemic as we should be, but at the same time, we are doing work to prepare ourselves better. And it's to catch, as I said, novel, novel pathogens like this coronavirus, to catch emerging antimicrobial resistance, to catch bioterrorism. And so one of the things we are doing is working with organizations around the world, like the CDCs around the world, but also with philanthropies uh, like the Gates Foundation, for example, to set up a global network um, of, uh, you know, of, of sequencers that will sequence you know, sort of local environments to see what's emerging. Lots of work to be done. One is to try and figure out, okay, you know, how do we get access? Should we plug into lo local sewage systems, into blood banks? Mm -hmm. How do we get access to pathogens in, a, in an area? Um, it's also important, it's very clear now that we are all connected here around the world on this, that what happens in a market in one country matters to everybody else around the world. And so, 
you know, uh, I think for developed CDCs, you know, they, they understand the need to bring up sequencing capacity uh, for, for CDCs in, de in, developing, in the developed world. And then we're also, we just shipped a set of sequencers into a number of countries in Africa. So we're contributing to that as well as working with philanthropies to try and create again, this networked, you know, uh, this networked system. In a lot of cases, uh, these were the first sequencers into those countries, the first time they had sequencing capacity. So we're gonna stand it up and we're gonna try and stand it up in a global way so that the next time, you know, we catch it even faster. Next time we have more data about it faster. So Root and the great work that, you know, the vaccine developers and the therapy developers are doing, uh, that work can get started even faster. All right, Amy, I'm going to give you the last word. We're just about out of time, but, you know, we, we've talked a lot about going through this pandemic, but if there are takeaways, you know, is there anything that we've done right? Anything really cool that's come out of this? I mean, I think what Francis was just talking about is an example of that. I think also one of the other things that's coming out of this pandemic is we're learning how to conduct clinical trials differently. You mentioned the recovery trial, which is a platform trial that's going on in the UK and is now being mimicked in the United States in, in a couple of different ways. We've seen more remote monitoring of patients using telemonitoring and other mechanisms. We have seen the use of real world data to fill in clinical trials data sets and we're learning about how um, that impacts or doesn't data integrity for clinical trials data sets and how we can use that in the future. We have um, also started to see new ways of using sensors and other activities to monitor patients. And we even have looked at use of delivering investigational product to patients near their home or at their home so that they don't need um, to go to cities far away to participate in clinical trials. So I think one of the areas that's a great silver lining is on the clinical trials innovation front. And then the second one, I think, is we've developed a lot of familiarity with data science and what new capabilities look like in this pandemic. And I think that's gonna take us a long way. All right, well, I think that's our time. Thank you three for being here. This was fascinating and can't wait to hear about all of these developments in the pipeline. Thanks again. Be safe. Thank you. Thank you.